We want to continue tonight uh, talking about the gift of the word of wisdom that we were looking at uh, last week. I want to remind you here from 1 Corinthians 12, 7, 11, and 18 that the word of God does inform us that every single member in the body of Christ does have, have a gift and does have a function there. I think this is a fairly new revelation to a lot of charismatics. Although they've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, they've been full of the Holy Ghost, they've never, never been taught or never understood that they had a responsibility coupled with that blessed privilege of speaking in tongues, and that is to stir up and manifest the other gifts of the Spirit. Not that the prayer language is the gift of the Spirit, I'm not saying that, not one of the 15 gifts of the Spirit, but that our spiritual power and uh, blessing not just be dissipated, in praise and speaking in tongues, but that we accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in the last days, and that is pull down the devil's stronghold. And the gifts of the Spirit are God's primary way for doing that, pulling down Satan's stronghold, like in Ephesians 6. He said, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against these principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, and wicked spirits in heavenly places. That's what was impressed on my heart as we were standing here before the Lord then, that there, there are rulers of the darkness of this world, and the Greek says in Ephesians six twelve, wicked spirits in the heavenly places. And you and I as Christians, believing what we do in God's word, do have authority over such things, over such spirits. And of course, God's not going to find anyone else to do battle against them. It must be us. But in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7, 11, and 18, the Bible says that you do have a gift or gifts of the Spirit. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Verse 11, but all these worketh at one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man, every man, severally as he will. In verse 18, but now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body, as it has pleased him. So we all do have a function, we all do have a gift in the body of Christ. And our responsibility upon gathering once more with one another here in this place is not only to come and receive, but to come and give. And we mentioned that earlier in the teaching on our twofold responsibility when we do gather together, together as a body and experience the Acts 242 Cornelia Fellowship, that we are to first of all come to give of ourselves to the Lord and to one another through the gifts of the Spirit, through our praise. That's such a blessing to watch all of you give of yourselves in praise to the Lord. And by the way, that really does encourage those around you. When they see your exuberant demonstration of thankfulness to the Lord, then naturally they're probably going to follow suit. It always encourages me to see others praising and worshiping the Lord. But besides that, we have a responsibility here in 1 Corinthians 12 of ministering to one another. And the same thing is said in 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. If you'll turn with me over to 1 Peter 4, beginning at verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter 4.10. As you receive the gift, dear Christian, then manifest the same one to another. If any man speak, well, are you teaching us, testifying? Are you prophesying? Then let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, then let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We're told in Acts 17.11 that those disciples in Berea were more noble than those in Thessalonica because they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily to see if these things be so, Acts 17.11. But along with that comes the responsibility to minister the gifts of the Spirit to one another because we're told like in 1 Corinthians 14 and verse uh, 3, he that prophesieth speaketh not unto God, but unto men, to edification, exhortation, and comfort. This will be a, the basic distinction between your prayer language, praying in the Spirit, and the gift of tongues, 
because we're told here in 1 Corinthians 14 on several occasions that when you pray in the Spirit, you're not praying unto or on behalf of men. You're not praying so that men can hear you, but so that the Father can hear you. But with the gift of tongues and the accompanying gift of interpretation, then you're giving forth an utterance not that will bless God, but that will bless man. Whereas the praying in the Spirit that you get with the baptism of the Holy Spirit is to minister and to worship the Lord, to minister unto him and worship to him. Worship him. Now, over in the Old Testament, we want to look in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 7 here to show you something interesting again about the gift of the word of wisdom. Because, you see, remember, it's not really a word of wisdom. It's a logos of wisdom, which is a revelation or an unveiling of God's wisdom. And as such, of course, it's not a word. Generally, it's going to constitute more than a word. But um, it is a revelation of some future event can't be present, can't be past. It's a revelation of some future event that you, in the natural or otherwise, apart from revelation, could never have known. For example, if you just come across with a general, and you see, sometimes a general statement may be predictive and even prophetic simply because it's predictive, but it's not necessarily a word of wisdom. Like in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul said, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truth breakers, incontinent, fierce, and so forth. But there he's not, he's giving something that is predictive. He said this is going to come to pass in the last days, but you see he already had the rest of the word of God that said that. So it wasn't a word of wisdom. He was merely saying something that the word had said. But when you go as so far as to say, predict something that's going to take place, and remember whether it's a moment or a year, it doesn't matter. As long as it's a moment in the future or a year in the future. As long as it's in the future, even if it comes in prophecy, we're going to look at the, some of the ways the word of wisdom does come. Even if it comes that way, it is still a supernatural gift of the word or the revelation of wisdom. We're going to continue to call it the word of wisdom just because that's, the popular term for it. We'll have to write the whole Bible over if we're going to change all the words and really get a, a more technically correct uh, definition of it. But here in 2 Samuel uh, 7, we'll begin with verse 1. It's interesting that as far as the word of wisdom goes, the word of wisdom cannot or could not have otherwise been known even by the best of spiritual minds. Because remember, this is one of the interpretation of, interpretations of a word of wisdom is that, you know, you've either gotten it from living a long time on the earth or it's insight into the scripture and you're wise about matters that are going to take place or you can give wise counsel and so forth. But I want you to notice here a prophet of God, when he speaks out of his own heart, it's not that he's, he said anything wrong, but he's not spoken by revelation. And before he even gets out of the premise here, God has called him and said, now go back and give him a word of wisdom. And God corrects him. Second Samuel chapter 7 and verse 1. And it came to pass when the king, this is King David, sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies, that the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. And Nathan said to the king, Go and do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. Well, what was in David's heart? The thought of building the temple. That was in his heart. He said, Look at the magnificent place in which I dwell, and the, the ark of God is held behind curtains in that portable tabernacle. And what does Nathan say? Go do everything in your heart, God is with you. Verse 4, And it came to pass that night, that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shalt thou build me a house for me to dwell in, whereas I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in a tent and in a tabernacle? Go down to verse 12. He's still prophesying here. And when the days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, now already you know he's switched over to talking future events here, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, 
and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now you see, here is the prophet of God. Who he is speaking by revelation and by inspiration, of course, is infallible. But to show you that the word of wisdom does never come by natural understanding, no matter how much Bible knowledge or no matter how old an individual may be, we have this for an example. But here Nathan, a prophet ordained of God, who has already before this predicted many things that did come to pass, when he went before David and did speak by revelation, he miss, he's missing it. And he's saying, David, go and do all that is in your heart. When the Lord doesn't want him to do that at all. However, when God's word does come to him that night, he goes back and begins to prophesy to David. And in this, we find the gift of the word of wisdom being manifested. Totally apart from any understanding that he possessed in himself. You see, the thing is, the thing to remember is that many times when a word of wisdom is dropped into your conscious mind, it has to come into your conscious mind for you to realize what it is, when it is dropped in there, many times it's going to sound completely far out to you because it's part of God's wisdom being revealed to you. Now, notice what he said here in verse 13. He said, Nathan talking to David, said, I'm going to set up your seat after you who will, be, who will build this temple and I will establish his throne forever. Well, we're not given Nathan's personal thoughts here after he prophesied, but no man can live forever. How can his throne be established forever? Then in verse 16, And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision did Nathan speak unto David. We'll come back to verse 17 later on because we see one way in which he got it there. He got what he knew by a vision. But to prophesy to someone, such and such is going to take place in your life and it'll never come to an end, well, you think, well, the person's got to die sometime, so how in the world can that be true? Well, we know that he's gone on past Solomon to speak of Christ. We see it picked up the same thing in Luke chapter 1, where it said that he would set up Christ's throne coming from the loins of the lineage of King David and, of course, from Solomon, which would never be destroyed. The same thing is in Daniel 2. With, remember the account of the uh, great stone cut out of the mountain without hands, which fell upon the, the toes of the great image, the great colossal image? That's in Daniel 2. Well, that was the kingdom of Christ. And he said he had set up this kingdom that would never pass away. So remember that whenever a word of wisdom does come to you, it may seem a little far out and out of the ordinary to you. Now, over, let's look over in Colossians uh, chapter 2 and verse 3 to find out where this wisdom is located. Colossians 2, well, verses uh, 2 and 3 of Colossians 2. that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. 1 Corinthians 1.24 But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. You see, Jesus is the wisdom of God. And then Romans 11, 33 through 36. Romans 11, 33 through 36. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? For of him, and through him, and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. You see, we, in many cases, are going to come across situations in our lives where we are deficient in our wisdom and our understanding. Now, I'm not talking about understanding about how to resolve a problem. That wouldn't be the gift of the word of wisdom, would it? But I'm talking about what God wants us to do 
what he has planned to come to pass in our life, what he has planned to come to pass in a nation. You see this throughout the Old Testament, that he gave revelation to his saints concerning things that were about to come to pass concerning nations. And generally, it wasn't their own nation, it was other nations. And he was still giving them revelation about that. But we find in these verses here that the location, the source of all this wisdom, is found in the Lord. All right, now look in Amos chapter 3. We find out that God's not stingy, he doesn't seek this wisdom, but he gives it to man. Amos 3 and verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Well, that's pretty plain, pretty clear there. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And then in John 16 and 13, See, whenever out of God's unlimited supply of wisdom and understanding of future events, whenever one specific incident is lifted out of God's miraculous wisdom and placed in your conscious mind, then it becomes the gift of the word of wisdom. And since we know it's really not a word but a revelation of wisdom, it naturally doesn't have to be spoken. It can still be a gift of the word of wisdom and never be spoken. John 16:13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Now there we just see general guidance by the Holy Spirit, and he'll guide you into all truth. But he goes on past that. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. There you've got the gift of the word of wisdom. And then finally, Revelation 4 in verse 1. So we wouldn't have revelation if it wasn't for this first verse in chapter 4. At least we wouldn't have chapters 4 through 22, because all of it is future events. Not all necessarily in chrono chronological order. You need to remember that. Some people get it divided up into chronological order from chapter 4 to chapter 22, and there you're going to get a, a perverted doctrine of eschatology because it's, God's not put it in here like that. Some of the things here in chapters 4 and 5, uh, what we're going to see uh, at the very end. And then in chapter 7, you've got people being saved out of the Great Tribulation period, or out of any part. Well, there it mentions the Great Tribulation period, and you don't even have the beginning of the Tribulation mentioned until way over there in chapter 12. So you can't get it all divided up chronologically. But in Revelation 4 and verse 1, John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And so from Revelation 4.1 through Revelation 22.21, you have nothing but future events, things that have not taken place yet. Even up to the present hour, things that have not taken place yet. All the way from Revelation 4.1 to the end of the book, we've got nothing but word of wisdom. That's why I said, I think, last week, I remember making the comment that so much of the Bible, practically the whole Bible, is just one big word of wisdom. It is continually revealing things that are going to come to pass that no one could have known had not God made it manifest. That he takes that from his unlimited supply of wisdom, and that's what the word of wisdom is, and then drop one small portion of it down into your conscious mind, and all of a sudden, you know something that's going to take place. And you see, outside from this, there is no reason, there is no way you could know that that was going to take place. That's how you know it's a word of wisdom. You know, <laughs> some people work a word of wisdom up, it's like working uh, a word of knowledge up, and you know, you see someone coming in the back door out there, being led in by someone, and they're shouting in the ear, telling them, you know, turn here, turn there, and you can gather the person's probably blind and hard of hearing at that. And so it would be a little unethical, well, I think there's someone here that's blind tonight, the Lord wants to heal you, well, you saw them walk in like that. And this is the way people who work the word of wisdom up, they've already got an inclination because of some other situation, what's going to take place, well, let me give you a word of wisdom, I see this happening in your life. Well, uh, 
If it's simply a two plus two equals four situation, it wouldn't take a word of wisdom, it just takes addition. And you can just add that up and find, yeah, if you do this and do that, you'll probably fall. You don't need to pronounce it as a word of wisdom or anything like that to them. You don't even need to prophesy it to them. Just say, well, that's what the word of God says. The two plus the two does equal the four. Now, if this were, as some people claim, this gift of the word of wisdom, if it were something that came by age, rather than by a supernatural gift or revelation of God, then why is it that we see young people, both in the Bible and today, being used in the gift? You see, it can't come by age. And if the word of wisdom, as some people claim, is merely deep insight into God's word, rather than a supernatural revelation of a future event, then why is it that people who sometimes know nothing about the word, including lost people, why are they sometimes given the gift of the word of wisdom? You see what I'm saying? It couldn't be merely insight into God's word. It couldn't merely be the sagacious counsel of an old man. Because many times it's someone young, and on occasion, uh, let me show you this occasion over in the book of Numbers, on occasion it can be someone that's not even saved. Look over in Numbers. I'll have to find a chapter. I think it's, um, well, it's over toward the end. I think it's 24. Numbers 24 and verse 17. Now, all scholars know that this is a Christological prophecy here, referring to Christ. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. In verse 19, out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. Well, do you know who gave this prophecy? Does anyone know who gave this prophecy in Numbers 24? Balaam did. And we're told later on, I think it's over in Deuteronomy, that the children of Israel, whenever they finally conquered the land, it mentions one fellow by name they slew with the sword because he was the one that introduced idolatry into Israel, and that was Balaam, the false prophet. And the Israelites slew him with the sword because he had in introduced idolatry into their monotheistic religion. And yet here he's giving a word of wisdom. You and I couldn't have given that. He said there's going to be a star that rises out of Jacob. We're told over in Revelation 2, the end of Revelation 2 and Revelation 22, that Jesus is the bright and the morning star. I think that's in Revelation 22. In verse 16, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the assemblies. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and the morning star. And by the way, uh, for overcomers, that is something which we are promised. In Revelation 2 and 28, to him that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, I will give him the morning star. Well, there's some deeper significance to what he's saying there, that the overcomer will possess a deeper or greater portion of Christ than anyone else around. Because it's only to these that overcome is this promise made available that they will possess the morning star, and we know that to be the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're saying is that all these other interpretations of what the word of wisdom is fall short of what God's word tells us it to be. And remember that in the word of God we don't have definitions for these things. You've got a definition for faith, not the gift of faith though, but you do have a definition for faith there in Hebrews 11.1. 1. However, for most of these things, God is simply going to show us examples of them. And then if we want to formulate our own definition, that's fine. You don't really need to, just as long as you know what you're talking about or you know what God's Word is talking about when it mentions the gift of the Word of Wisdom. Now, we want to look at several ways that the gift of the Word of Wisdom can come to an individual. And the first one is by audible voice. 
And don't think that's something too strange or too far out, audible voice. Of course, we mean there God speaking audibly to you. Because uh, it seems to me that my Bible said over in John 10 that my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Well, how can you hear a voice unless somebody talks to you? Well, we know we can interpret that spiritually, meaning that he leads us and guides us, but that's not what he said there, though. He said, my sheep hear my voice. So don't think that it's too far out that God would speak to you audibly because he's doing that all over the place. And you don't have to be in the ministry for him to speak to you audibly. Matter of fact, most of the people I've heard of that he's talked to audibly have not been in the ministry because they vastly outnumber those that aren't. As an example, let's look in Genesis uh, 12, the first three verses of Genesis 12, for a way in which the word of wisdom can be made manifest to you. You see, God's got the wisdom. He's got all the wisdom that he needs to have or that you need to have. He knows all things that are, that are going to take place. We read, I think, over in uh, Isaiah, he knows the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning. But it's another thing entirely for him to know it than for you to know it. And if he knows it, then how is he going to get this down on your level? Well, here's one way in, Revel in uh, Genesis 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram. And see, this was very characteristic in the early patriarchal period for God to manifest himself in what we call a theophany. And that is a visible appearance of God and he would actually manifest himself in some type of visible form. Of course, it would be uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in his pre-incarnate state. And he would take upon him the form either of a man or of an angel told us later on right here in scripture that God would give these theophanies. Now later on in scripture you don't see them occurring as readily. Uh, on occasion you do see them seeing the Lord in a vision or in a dream. Like in Isaiah 6, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Well it's generally felt that he saw him by, re by revelation, by a vision, but not personally. But in these early chapters in Genesis, when they've got, they've got no revelation, of course, they've got no Bible or anything, God just comes down here and walks around and talks to them personally. So the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. No word of wisdom yet. He's just given him a commandment. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now here is a man, friends. He is not a Jew. He is, remember, he's the first Hebrew. He's the beginning of the Hebrews. He's not a Jew. He's not an Israelite. He does not belong to a privileged nation of God like Israel came to be through the man Abraham. He is a man over in the Ur of the Chaldees in Babylonian mystery religion. And God reaches down, puts his hand on his life, and calls him to a land, of course, that Abraham never knew. And it even says over in Joshua that his fathers were serving pagan gods. Joshua, I think, the first few verses in Joshua 24. And uh, here he reaches down and takes Abraham, tells him to leave his family. You see, this is why he's got a little trouble there in the end of Genesis 11, because uh, he didn't leave his family. He takes his dad and his brothers and everyone else along with him, and they didn't leave Ur of the Chaldees, and they go up to Iran and stay there for a while. And uh, you see there in the last verse in chapter 11, his father, the days of Terah, were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. God had to wait till they had died for him to take Abraham as he had called him. But if you look over in Galatians 3, then we're going to see Paul taking only what God has revealed right here in uh, Genesis 12, taking that, bringing us into the picture as being from the loins of Abraham. Beginning uh, with verse 
7 of Galatians 3. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Do you think Abraham heard the gospel? Well, it just says he preached the gospel to him. What was the gospel? In thee shall all nations be blessed. So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. Verse 16, Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, plural, but as of one, singular, and to thy seed, which is Christ. That's why he heard the gospel, because he heard the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of whether he understood all of it or not. God said, I'll bless all nations through your seed, singular. Now go down to verse 29. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. He's gone back there, that word of wisdom that was revealed to Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, and taken it and brought Gentiles into the, into the picture. Just from what he said there in Genesis 12. I don't know what version, I guess most of you have a King James version, but um, there is a version around that back in Genesis 12, 3, I just mentioned this, the last part of the verse, our Bible says, and the Hebrew says, in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. You see, if you can get that out of there, then you can get the promise of the Messiah out of there. If you can get that last phrase out of there. And some versions do have that translated, you shall bless yourself, which really doesn't make any sense at all. But that rules out the prophecy of Christ because he said in thee, meaning in his loins, Christ, which came from Abraham's loins, in thee would all families, all nations of the earth be blessed. If you can get that out of there, then you've got a problem with Abraham and Christ and everyone else. So there is a version that translates that, and you shall bless yourself. Does anyone have that version? No one's got that version? Well, I've seen it around before. Probably the same one that says the last few verses in Mark 16 aren't for today. They try to get those out of the oldest manuscripts too. It's probably the same old devil working in both ends. And now let's look over in uh, Second Kings. We'll be looking in Kings uh, a lot tonight because of the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. But in Second Kings 2, I'm going to show you here several groups of people had a word of wisdom. Matter of fact, they had the same word of wisdom. We're still talking about that it can come audibly to you. You see, it can come, God can speak audibly to you. Here, somehow, these prophets, these sons of the prophets, have had a word of wisdom revealed to them, and then they give it to Elijah, or to Elisha, which makes it audible to him. That's how he hears it. He doesn't get it any other way. 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 1. And it came to pass, when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. That's just a popular way of saying, Listen, I'm telling, the, telling you the truth. As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold ye your peace. Well, how did they know that? And all of them knew that. Well, let's read on here. And Elisha said unto him, said unto him Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? That's verbatim. 
and they're in another city. And he answered, Yea, I know it, hold ye your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, smote the waters, they were divided hither and thither, so that the two went over on dry ground. And you find out in the next few verses that very same thing that they've been prophesying or been predicting is going to take place comes to pass because Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind up into heaven. But here you've got groups of prophets, like 50 men in each group, in separate cities, both saying verbatim the same thing that's going to come to pass. They couldn't have gotten that from one another. No telephones or telegraph could wire it to one another. They got that by revelation. But it's interesting to see they both got the identical same thing, word for word the same thing. You see it there in verse 6, and you see it in verse 3. Okay, another way that the uh, word of wisdom can come to you, and this is a very popular way, is by inward witness. Let's look in 2 Peter 1, verses 12 to 14. And you see, you need to be aware of these things because as you're praying in the Spirit, you're fasting, you're seeking the Lord, then you want to have your spirit and your mind open to receive whatever he might have to say to you. And you just be, a, be surprised what he might drop down into your heart sometime. But this, I guess, is probably the most popular or common way that it, that it comes. Since we do have the baptism of the Holy Spirit and are supposed to discern the voice of the Spirit within us, then we have the inward voice of the Spirit. 2 Peter 1, verses 12 to 14. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put, this, put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Well, do you know what he has reference to there? He's going to die. And you see over in the end of John's gospel, Jesus mentions this, mentions what type of death he'll die. We get a hint of crucifixion here in the very end of John's gospel. But the time period from the end of John's gospel and Peter writing Second Peter uh, has been a long time. Now, John hadn't written his gospel, of course, by the time Peter wrote Second Peter, but, of course, these occurrences in John had already taken place years ago. But how is it when we get over to Second Peter, now he says, the Lord has shown me that shortly I must put this tabernacle off. Well, we're in John chapter 21, verses 18 and 19. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, when thou wast young, Thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. Peter is confused, and he talks about him, talks to him concerning some other things in the end of the chapter about John and whether John's going to die or not, but you've still got Christ mentioning his death here. However, 2 Peter 1, again, remember, he's saying that the Lord Jesus has shown me shortly that I must put this tabernacle off. You say, Could God, would God show you something like that? Why, well, certainly he would. He shows people when it's time to marry, when it's time to buy the house, when it's time to sell the house, all types of things he'll tell you. Sometimes just to save your skin. See, all these, these gifts of the Spirit, friends, don't necessarily have some great, although they can, they don't necessarily have some great spiritual significance to them. He might just, and he very frequently does, 
reveal things to you just for your own personal benefit. I mean, he doesn't want you going off into wild, strange air or doctrine or anything else. And if you're sensitive to a spirit and, of course, staying in his word, why, well, you'll just have a check sometimes about things. And then on some occasions, he'll just reveal to you, whoa, that's not right at all. And you might not could have known it because you didn't know what the word said on that, but he might just give that to you as a revelation. He'll show you things to come about your family. I remember one time when I was down at school, this was back in early uh, 1978, that I had uh, been praying, I had been, well, I think it was in January of 1978, and I had uh, just gotten back to school from the semester break that we had there at the university. And, of course, I was a freshman there at school. And this was one night in January, I believe it was January the 9th, 1978, I still remember the night, that as I was, I, I think I'd been praying, something like that, I'd been praying, studying the word, and so forth, and I wasn't, see, you don't go seeking these words, Lord, give me a word about such and such, tell me what's going to take place, but as I was praying and as I was meditating, all of a sudden, I began to prophesy. And I was prophesying to myself. You say, can you do that? Well, certainly you can do that. You can prophesy to yourself. It's to men for edification, exhortation, and comfort. So anyway, I, I began to prophesy, and among other things that I said, in essence, I remember saying this to myself, son, since you are settled concerning your family, then I am settled. And that was all there was to it. Now, it wasn't that God wasn't settled in the first place. He was already settled. I'm talking about household salvation because I had been claiming that in my word. I had been confessing that 10,000 times, confessing Joshua 24, 15 for my family. And you can't just prophesy. The, I mean, we'd love to just prophesy to ourselves, thus saith the Lord, tomorrow everyone in your family will be saved. We'd love to do that, but it just doesn't work like that. However, when it is a word that's been revealed by God, given from God to you about some event like that, then you simply wait and see, does it come to pass or does it not? Well, so far what he had given me was not anything that could or could not come to pass. He simply said, since you are settled concerning your family, you know, I've gotten it settled in my heart and my faith was settled, I'm going to stand on your word. And he said, since you are settled, then I am settled. That was January. Three months later, March, March the 9th, it was the same day, March the 9th, I was not prophesying. Here again, I'm showing you the distinction on some ways it can come. There it came by prophecy. Here I was simply praying, meditating before the Lord, and I had that inner witness. It just explodes inside of you. I had that inner witness inside of me that said, your family will come in shortly. They see, I've been believing for him for two years. And like I said, we'd love to prophesy to ourselves about things that are going to come to pass when they sound good. That's what the false prophets do. They always prophesy things that they like. So you don't want to get in the habit of doing that. But the word came, your family will come in shortly. Two weeks later, see, I've been believing for this for two years and hadn't seen one change, one iota, no change whatsoever. If anything, it had gotten worse. Matter of fact, it had. But two weeks later, I go home from school, and all of us, and my mother and I just began talking, and all of a sudden, she wants to start talking about spiritual matters. So we begin to talk about the Lord. We begin to talk about healing, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, she had had problems about all those things. And finally, we got around to talking about occult deliverance. And she said, that's what I need. She said, I got an old demon of unbelief in me. And she said, I need to go through occult deliverance. And she didn't even know what it was. And here was all this coming out of her mouth. I need deliverance so I can get the Holy Ghost and start believing the way you believe. And that was two weeks after the time that that word of wisdom had come in my heart, your family will come in shortly. And it was within a couple of months that... Um, my older sister, her husband, my younger sister, and her boyfriend have also come into the charismatic blessing. Now, I could have waited around. I didn't need to have the word. I was already believing that by faith anyway. But it was just kind of nice for the Lord to let you in on what's going to take place. 
You see, friends, this is so interesting because here we stand tonight and you don't know anything about tomorrow. But God knows everything about tomorrow. But you don't know one thing. You don't even know what's going to happen after the service. Not one thing about it. Unless you're going to go do something and you don't even know if you can do it. You don't know anything for certain that's going to take place after the service. But when you compare yourself to God, he knows everything that's going to take place. Tomorrow, the next day, the, ne the next week, and so forth. And therefore, it's nothing for him just to drop down into your heart a word of wisdom like this. Well, let's go to this a third way that it can be revealed to you. And that is, and let's go over to 1 Kings, and that is by prophecy. 1 Kings 17. Now, in the two examples that I just gave you, there one came by the inner witness of the Spirit, the other came by the gift of prophecy. And when we get to some of the other gifts, we'll look at them, we'll look at some uh, examples where you see a variety of gifts, maybe all in the same sentence. Well, there's one here I remember in, sec in 1 Kings that all in one sentence you see several different gifts being mentioned there. So just because it's prophecy doesn't rule out the fact that it can be a word of wisdom contained somewhere in that prophecy, or maybe if you're giving it as a prophetic utterance like thus saith the Lord, or like the Lord says, and you say something and it's predictive, and that's all you say, then the whole prophecy that you just gave is the same thing as a word of wisdom. You see what I'm saying? But some of the things that I had said in the prophecy that before I mentioned this about my family or the Lord mentioned that to me were not predictive. They were simply to encourage me. But in the, in the midst of that came a prediction that because you are settled, then I am settled. And of course, you know what I took that to mean. Well, praise God, things are fixing to happen here. And three months later, I got another word. They'll come in shortly. And two weeks later, here they came running in. And it was all by the gift of the word of wisdom that I had this revealed to me. I remember at the same time that the Lord was revealing this to me, I had a word spoken to my heart, and it wouldn't be a word of wisdom, it just one simple sentence, and the Lord said, Yes, my son, you do have the victory. You wonder, how, how can you remember such a, an insignificant phrase like that? Well, if God ever tells you that directly, You'll do what I did. I took off outside and I ran up and down seven flights of stairs twice. And then I was foolish enough to ride home and tell my folks what I did. And they just couldn't imagine what had gotten into me there in college. Too much studies had gone to my brain. No, I'd gotten the anointing there when God said, Yes, my son, you do have the victory. I was on the top of the dormitory, the seventh floor, and I took out Holland and I went up and down the stairs seven times, seven flights of stairs twice just shouting and hollering. And I don't know what people thought. I didn't really care. I had a private room so I could go retreat back to my room if I got in trouble. That's not why I got a private room. I got it so I could get into my studies and not be bothered by everyone's music and their whatever they do at college, which is a lot. Oh, it was a blessing. I remember that. And see, I was on the, I was on the seventh floor. Now, this is off the subject, but it's just a blessing, so I'm going to tell it to you anyway. I was on the seventh floor of the dormitory. That was the top floor, and it was for graduates only. It was, it, it was the graduate floor, and it was for graduate students only. And I was a freshman. And, you know, if you're a senior or a junior, maybe they'll let you get up there with the uh, graduates because, you know, they expect you to have sown enough wild oats by then and you're ready to calm down and get out of school in under 15 years. And which most people, <laughs> they're in there a long time. But I was planning on getting out of there in three years and they just didn't know that yet. Well, I didn't know it yet. The Lord knew it and revealed it to me in my third year and I had to put two years into one. But I got up there, I went over there, I remember to the, uh, the housing director I just got a letter from a friend at school here not long ago and heard that he was killed in an automobile accident not long ago. But uh, thank God he was a believer. But I went and remember sitting in his office telling him my story about that I was a Christian and I wanted to study the Bible. And so that's why I wanted the room in the, on the graduate floor. And he said, that's impossible. We don't let freshmen on the graduate floor. Well, 
I just kept believing I was going to get that, that room anyway. He said, come back next Friday and I'll let you know. And I said, I already know I'm going to get that room. Because, see, there was one room available up there. And if any graduate student had wanted the room, of course, my name would have been scratched instantly. Well, came back next Friday and he said, that room is yours. So I just praised God for that and moved all my stuff in there and had to pay, of course, twice to get the room. You got to pay double rent to get the room. And that took a big chunk out of some money I had saved up, but it was worth it because I got to study. Praise God. And um, where was I? But anyway, I was on this word that the Lord gave me concerning victory. I said, my son, yes, you do have the victory. And uh, see, there it's not a word of wisdom. It's just a revelation that he gives to your conscious mind or to your spirit. And when he gives you a revelation like that, that, my friends, will get you excited. And if you don't have any stairwell to run up and down, you can do as one man did. He climbed to the very top of a pecan tree. He got so excited about believing the promises on healing. And uh, he was driving down the expressway, and the devil tried to put a heart attack on him, and he slammed on the brakes. He jumped out of his car. He spotted a pecan tree, and he took off up that thing like a squirrel, got up to the very top of it, and yelled, Now, devil, take that! And that was the end of the heart attack. <laughs> but, you know, you've got to get exuberant sometimes. Um, well, that's another message on praise, isn't it? Praise God. Hallelujah. I was exuberant when the Lord was giving me those words, though. I'll tell you what, I never had such a blessed time as being, and oh, I got criticized. You don't ever come out of your room. What's wrong with you? What are you doing in there? You, all types of things people bring against me, and I was just trying to be obedient servant and pray and study the Word. But I'll tell you what, I thank God I did because I wouldn't be here tonight if I wouldn't have been in that room that night. If I'd been around throwing ball and playing and going to all the parties like everyone else, well, I'd be far behind right now. First Kings uh, 17 and verse 14, one that comes by prophecy. I don't want to tell the whole story because it's long, but it's Elisha and the woman at Zarephath. Here in verse 14, prophecy, for thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. See, he's said that there's not going to come rain upon the earth until I say so back in verse 1. But here, how did he know that she is never going to run out of any food? Well, he gives her a word of wisdom. Chapter 20, verses 41 to 43. See, friends, getting back to the story I was just telling you, you've got no idea, and this is what I want to emphasize to you that's brought to my mind now, the, the impact that your life and what you're doing right now is going to have upon other people that you come into contact with. You see, there I am. See, what you're, what you're getting right now, you wouldn't be getting it, or you could have gotten it from someone else. You certainly wouldn't have got it from me if I wouldn't have been in that room preparing. And that was way back when I was 18 years old then. But see, the one thing that I've always had in my heart is do not be nearsighted. See, if people are nearsighted, then all this that we're doing, all we're studying, we're planning on being overcomers and everything, well, that doesn't make any sense at all. But if you can keep your eyes, if you can be farsighted and keep your eyes upon what God is fixing to unfold on this generation, then it makes everything much more worthwhile. And I never considered the, the uh, as some people would call, the the disadvantage of not having any friends or not getting to do anything fun, I didn't consider that a disadvantage. I considered that a privilege so I could have more time to study his word. You see what I'm saying? You're going to have what you're doing right now. It may seem insignificant to you. I didn't know any of you then. I didn't know I was going to be here then. I had no ministry. I had a calling, but I mean, what's a calling? I mean, a calling is a calling. It's something good, but you can't put yourself into the ministry. I didn't know how's that going to ever take place. And there I am, studying First Kings, reading Genesis, studying about the gift of the word of wisdom. 
Well, what are you doing tonight? You're doing the same thing. Don't think that what you're doing when you study at home or whatever is minor or insignificant or unimportant because you're going to have a tremendous effect upon this generation. I can guarantee you that if you're an overcomer. Now, if you're not, you probably won't have much of an effect. But if you're going to be an overcomer or if you are an overcomer, then you're going to have a tremendous effect upon this generation. So it behooves us to count these things as very dear and precious to us and serious when we're studying about God's Word. See, I can look back on those hours and if any of you have been saved a long time and you are studying like that yourself, then you can look back on all the, the lonely hours that in themselves are nothing. But when you see the consequences of preparation before manifestation, of being diligent before being used. If you can see the importance of those things, well, then it just throws a whole new light upon the whole thought of preparation and of study and of being diligent in your Christian life. The prayers you're praying. See, what you're learning right now, the beliefs that you are obtaining from the Word of God, they're having effect on other people is what I'm saying. And especially if any of you in here got a calling to the ministry, which I'm sure there are those of you that do or shall have, what you're doing right now is going to have effect upon so many people. If ministers or even if Christians could only see how important that is, if they could just see the importance of that thought, that well, they wouldn't be so lackadaisical in their spiritual life. They would be a little more assiduous in getting into God's Word and studying it. I know they would be. It's just like Jeremiah said. It's in Jeremiah chapter 20 there. It's just a compelling force that you have within you. And I know everyone here can bear witness with that. What I say? 20, 41 to 43... I'm just giving you the end of some of these stories here, but we're going to look at several cases where, of course, it's talking about the old wicked king Ahab here, where he's being prophesied to, and the prediction of his ruin is coming forth. Verse 41, this is one of the prophets there, a prophet that wanted to hide beside the road and pretend that he wasn't a prophet. And uh, you see this in the preceding verses. He gets another fellow to wound him so he can look wounded, and he's laying there beside the road, and he's got his face covered with ashes. And King Ahab walks by and the prophet stands up and begins to talk to him. And as soon as he gets King Ahab's attention, then he wipes off the stuff from his face and Ahab says, Ah, you're one of the sons of the prophets. And he knew he was going to start prophesying to him. Verse 41. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face. And the king of Israel discerned him that he was of the prophets. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Because thou hast let Go out of thy hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction. This has been Hadad. Therefore thy life shall go for his life and thy people for his people. And the king of Israel went to his house heavy and displeased, I imagine so, and came to Samaria. You see, God had delivered into his hand the Syrians and had commanded him to utterly destroy them and their leader, Ben Hadad. And when Ahab didn't, Then this prophet was sent to give him word of wisdom that said, Now your life, Ahab, is going to be given for his life and your people for his people. Then in chapter 21, verses 17 through 19. 17 through 19. The word of the Lord came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel, which is in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, whither he has gone down to possess it, which he took by murder and illegally. And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Now here comes the word of wisdom, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs lick the blood of Naboth shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. Well, there comes very specific a word of wisdom. 
He gets the dogs in and he gets the place in and he gets the blood in and everything else. And then along with that, you look over in chapter 22 and verse 38. Verse 22 is the account of um, Micaiah ben Emla and Zedekiah ben Kanaena and they're at odds with one another on their prophecy concerning whether Ahab should go out or whether he shouldn't against Ramoth Gilead. And of course, Micaiah says, if you go out and come back at all, then the Lord's not spoken by me. Well, he goes out but doesn't come back. And look what happens to him in verse 37, 38. So the king died and was brought to Samaria, and they buried the king in Samaria. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood. And they washed his armor according to the word of the Lord which he spake. Well, that's referring back to that prophecy we just read. But you see, it came by word of wisdom. How did he know dogs were going to lick up the king's blood? Well, he got that by word of wisdom. Okay, let's go on here to another way that it can come. This is over in Daniel's book, and this is by vision. Daniel chapter 10. So far, we've got audible voice. It can come by inner voice. It may arrive by prophecy. And fourthly, it can come by vision to you. Daniel chapter 10. I was going to say some more things here on Daniel 10 and 11, but I don't think we better pause to do that. But I guess along with Zechariah and Revelation, Daniel probably is one of the most intriguing books in the Bible very pertinent to what's taking place today. And Daniel, of course, is just given one vision after another. And about 90% of it is future tense. But it's very specific in Daniel 10 and verse 14. 